Good evening. Thank you all for coming. My name is Marissa Hollywood. I'm the assistant director here at the Kufferberg Holocaust Center. Before we begin tonight's program, I just want to say a couple of things. So today, April 12, 2018, is Yom HaShoah, also known as Holocaust Remembrance Day. It's always held on the 27th day of the month of Nisan, and it's a day to commemorate the millions of people who perished during the Holocaust. Organizations around the country tonight and in the days that follow will light candles and will recite Kaddish, the prayer for the departed. Here at the KHC, we usually hold an event the Sunday prior to Yom HaShoah. And this year, unfortunately, we had to cancel last minute due to electrical maintenance that was taking place in this building. So today, on the actual day of remembrance, I just want to acknowledge a very significant loss for the center and for our community. With great sadness, the Kufferberg Holocaust Center at Queensborough Community College, CUNY, mourns the loss of Holocaust survivor, friend, and longtime volunteer, Ethel Katz. Born to Tunia Bauer in Poland in 1922, Ethel's life changed forever when Hitler's forces entered her town um, in July of 1941. Her family lived in Bukats, now part of the Ukraine, on a large pastoral estate. After her twin brother was killed, Ethel and her family spent years running from one temporary shelter to the next, and they were eventually discovered in 1944. Her entire family was gunned down as they tried to flee, and Ethel somehow managed to escape. Alone, she hid for months behind a false wall in a house that was occupied by German soldiers. Since the Kufferberg Holocaust Center's early days, Ethel was there to share her stories with students in hopes of preventing hate and to preserve the memory of her family. Aside from speaking to dozens of classes and community groups over the years, she also met with many Queensborough Community College students as part of the biennial Holocaust internship. This semester-long program, students learn the history of the Holocaust and then are assigned a local survivor to interview. Ethel participated every year since the program's inception in 2009, and she deeply impacted the lives of the students she met with. Ethel impacted every person that heard her story, and over the last three years, Ethel's eldest daughter, Felice, began to share her story when Ethel no longer had the voice to. Ethel passed away on Saturday, March 31st, 2018, and she will be deeply missed. In her memoir, she's quoted by saying, we learned not to cry, but we also learned not to forget. We cannot forget. We have six million reasons to remember. Please join with me in a moment of silence to commemorate Ethel Katz, the survivors we've lost in this last year, and all those who perished during the Holocaust. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. This is our second to last NEH sponsored event where we are exploring the theme of complicity and collaboration during the Holocaust. It's nice to see a lot of familiar faces here, as well as some new ones. For those of you who I haven't had a chance to meet personally yet, my name is Dr. Olai, and I'm the scholar in residence here at the Holocaust Resource Center for this academic year. Just to give you a little preview of what we've been exploring since the fall, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, we've been looking at complicity and collaboration which roughly translates to the role that bystanders played in either ignoring the ways that Jews and their communities were being persecuted, which would be complicity. Um, that's a type of uh, guilt through silence or through turning a blind eye as injustices are occurring or collaboration, which is an even more severe form of behavior where neighbors are actively 
facilitating and enabling Nazi atrocities to occur. So we've been exploring this theme since last year, and the other side of the complicity and collaboration coin is rescue and resistance. While this was in the minority for neighbors during the Holocaust, rescue and resistance is exploring those individuals who defied the status quo that was established in Nazi Germany and occupied territories, and with great effort and oftentimes through putting their own lives or their lives of loved ones in risk, went out of their way to offer aid rescue to uh, potential Jewish victims and or resist um, other policies of the violent Nazi regime. So I'm very excited for the speaker that we'll have this evening that will help us explore this very complex theme. Um, specifically to, to help us navigate the complexities of this topic and um, also to explore other specific genocides that she's researched, we have Dr. Luft, who's the Assistant Professor of Sociology at UCLA. So she's traveled from the West Coast and also weathered horrendous traffic this afternoon um, to make it here at our center. And um, we couldn't be happier to welcome her here tonight. She has researched extensively on the causes and consequences of mass violence, including genocide. Her work focuses on complex themes such as decision making during violent conflicts, the role that gender plays in politically violent movements, and a study of wartime defection, or how people shift from support for state violence to resistance and saving behaviors. Her work has included research spanning the globe from France to Rwanda, and she has been the recipient of a number of very prestigious fellowships, including at the Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C. Her uh, current project is a present book that she's researching and writing that's entitled Sacred Treason, and it's looking specifically at Catholic bishops in Vichy, France, who made decisions that either supported Nazi policies or resisted Nazi policies of genocide. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to our speaker, uh, Dr. Eliza Luft. So normally I would just say thank you for having me today, but I want to take a pause and just really say thank you. Um, we heard this beautiful introduction, a very tragic introduction about the history of the Holocaust. And many of you may have seen in the New York Times this morning an article that showed that only, I think, 22% of Americans really know about the history of the Holocaust and know about how many people were killed, how horrible it was. So for all of you to be here today, it shows that you care to learn to know and to keep that memory going. So really, thank you for coming out. It means a lot to me. One of the reasons why it means a lot to me, um, this is embarrassing, but maybe not so embarrassing because my mom's in the audience, um, is that I am a grandchild of four Holocaust survivors. And I might get emotional talking about it with it being Yom HaShoah today. Um, this is my first Yom HaShoah without my grandmother alive. She passed away last year. My grandfather passed away five years ago, I think, and he would have been 101 years old yesterday. So this is my siblings, my grandparents. I'm very fortunate to have grown up with a family that talked a lot about the Holocaust growing up, that shared their stories from a young age, and clearly it had a very profound impact on me. Um, and so as a result, I've spent most of my life trying in some capacity to understand what motivates people to participate in violence when they have no pre-existing history of violence to begin with. So really the civilians, the everyday people, neighbors who turned on neighbors, why did they do it? Um, and then when I was in college, uh, actually I had just come back from my junior year abroad uh, where I was in Prague and I was doing work, learning about how the Holocaust was being taught in Central and Eastern Europe. I came back and I watched the movie Hotel Rwanda. Mm -hmm. 
And I was shocked because the Rwandan genocide happened in my lifetime. Admittedly, I was 11 years old, but I was old enough at that point to know what genocide was, to understand it, to have seen some scenes on TV. And I felt very much complicit in the fact that I was silent. I didn't really pay attention. It was easy to ignore from a distance. Um, so that was very upsetting to me, and it prompted me to want to learn a lot more about the Rwandan genocide. But also, the story of Rwanda, of Hotel Rwanda, is a story about a man who is Hutu, who was expected to participate in the genocide because he was Hutu, and he ended up saving hundreds of Tutsis instead. And so paradoxically, even though today is Yamashoa, I'm going to start by talking about my work on Rwanda, and then I'm going to talk about my current project on the Holocaust in France. And that's because this story made me reflect more on my own family history. So here's a picture of me and my grandfather. Sorry. My grandfather, one of the reasons why he was able to survive the Holocaust was because a Nazi officer's mother took an interest in him, liked him, somehow, you know, cared about him and told her son-in-law that he had to drive my grandfather over the border and save him, put him in a place where he wouldn't be targeted by other Nazis. And he put my grandfather in the back of his car, he hid, un hid underneath the seat, drove him over the border, said get out of the car and run, and that's one of the ways that my grandfather managed to survive. And then you have my grandmother over here with my mom, it's in the front. <laughs> um, and my grandmother similarly you know, was on the run, her family was murdered in Majdanek, most of my grandfather's family was murdered in Auschwitz. My grandmother, one of the reasons why she was able to survive was because she and her sister, and her sister's boyfriend at the time, husband at the time, um, were actually uh, taken in by a Polish family who fed them in, you know, hid them underground in a pig farm, and her sister and her sister's husband basically survived off of these pig scrappings that they then passed on to my grandmother as well. Um, they also had a son who we, you know, sort of refreshed my memory this morning. Their son was killed by the son of the people who took their family in because they were worried he'd be too much of a threat. So again, you have a situation where people are simultaneously saving Jews and killing Jews. And this, you know, this question, how do people shift stances during a genocide? How do you support and resist violence in the same war? It really puzzled me. So I went to Rwanda and I started asking these questions. How could you be both a Nazi and save Jews? How could you be both a Hutu and save Tutsi? And what explains behavioral variation in genocide more generally? And that's the question that I explore in my research. I look at it at different levels of analysis, not because it's what I originally set out to do, but because I, it, it came up in the process of doing this work and I didn't have an easy answer. So I'll tell you a bit about the time I went to Rwanda. And I just want to let you know, it is such a beautiful country. Uh, they call it the land of a thousand hills, but there's also this saying that God sleeps in Rwanda because it's so beautiful. So I know people might have ideas about what Rwanda's like in their heads because of the history of the genocide there, but I just want to emphasize that it's a really lovely, wonderful place. It's not just a place of devastation and destruction. And so here I am in Rwanda. This is a picture I took of participants in the Rwandan genocide. And I was interviewing people, and they started telling me these stories. Well, I saved you know, my neighbor. Uh, he was running from the Hutu. But then the next day, I went out, and I killed four people. And then the next day, I refused to participate. And the day after that, I killed seven more people. And the day after that, I refused to participate again. And then I saved my sister-in-law. And then I killed this other person. And I was just totally baffled because this doesn't make sense. You know, it didn't make sense with the typical narrative we have of why people participate in genocide. You know, these are people who murdered people, who murdered their neighbors. So how could it be that they saved people at the same time? And the fact is they did. And yet, hopefully you've all been learning about different reasons, different theories about why people participate in genocide. These theories, to me, didn't provide an adequate explanation of how people make decisions in these violent contexts. And the reason why is because they go into it assuming once a killer, always a killer. So I started exploring this question with regards to the previous theories of why people participate in genocide. And I just want to go over these really briefly for people who don't know what the literature says more generally. <laughs> 
So the first theory stresses what it calls the power of hierarchical and bureaucratic structures, including things like obedience to authority. So Stanley Milgram, many of you have probably learned, conducted these famous experiments in which participants were paired with another participant and they were told to administer these shocks um, by someone who looked like a scientist, was wearing a white coat. And he found that two thirds of participants were willing to obey authorities' orders, even when it meant harming other people. And so he extended his findings to claim that participation in genocide can largely be explained by people who don't think and just follow orders. Now, a second approach is this intergroup antagonism theory, where scholars will call attention to things like racial cleavages, ethnic cleavages, religious cleavages, and they'll say that feelings about racial or ethnic differences, things like prejudice, explain participation in genocide. So the central theme here is that there has to be deep divisions and distrust between social groups for genocide to occur. A third perspective focuses on how perpetrators in group dynamics, let's say what's happening with them and other people who are like them, influence participation in genocide. And this says that things like peer pressure, um, groupthink, social norms explain why people participate, right? Everyone's killing and they say, if you don't kill, you're a loser, you're not one of us, we can't trust you. So people participate for those reasons, because of within group pressures, not because of feelings they have about the people they're killing, or not because a leader is telling them to. And then the fourth approach requires a dehumanization of the victim group before the violence begins. So this is defined by sociologist Helen Fine as the construction of others as outside the moral universe of obligation. And it's said to explain genocide because those who are doing the killing don't see their neighbors as humans anymore. So it's easy for them to do this. Victims become this monolithic other, they have no variation, you don't see them as individual people. And in contrast, this theory argues that if you saw your neighbor as humanity, if you thought that they were equal in worth and value to yourself, you wouldn't be able to kill them. So I really want to stress that none of these perspectives is wrong per se. And lots of evidence testifies to the fact that things like peer pressure or obedience to authority explain participation in genocide. But the picture is incomplete. And the reason why it's incomplete is because, again, so many of these perspectives take the approach once a killer, always a killer. Once someone participates in genocide, he or she can never act in any other way. But the fact is that someone might kill at time A, they might resist at time B, they might refuse to participate at time C, and then kill again at time D. And that kind of variation is largely ignored. But the evidence from my research in Rwanda, and also you'll soon see from my research in France as well, demonstrates that throughout genocide, a lot of people are making very, very complicated decisions. And they often shift stances as well. And hopefully, I mean, the goal for my research is that if we can tease out what influences these de decisions, why someone might kill at time A and not kill at time B, if you have a more accurate sense of why someone who is killing might suddenly stop, then we can start to identify good mechanisms for intervention, right? Oh, look, this person was killing, they stopped killing. A lot of people did for that reason. Well, maybe that's something that we can help do in Myanmar today, for example, or in Syria. So I try and build on my research, and this is something that I, you know, I'm publishing on and constantly trying to work on, to try and say if we can pinpoint those moments of variation, those are opportunities for intervention. So I want you to keep that in mind as I present some of my findings. Okay, so the first finding to emerge, um, sorry for that arrow, the first finding to emerge among the respondents who I interviewed in Rwanda and their recounting of what motivated their behavior in the genocide is that financial capital, economic capital, helped some Hutu refuse participation in violence. So when Hutu defected from killing by drawing on economic resources, they were motivated by what I described as a transactional mechanism, the exchange of economic capital for agency in a very dangerous and constrained setting like genocide. So if you look at Alphonse, who participated in the genocide, he explained, for someone who is caught cheating, it could be serious. He had to pay a fine determined by the leaders, a cash fine, for example, 2,000 Rwandan francs or more. 
and cheating in this context, of course, meant refusing to kill. Or we can look at Fulgence, who says, anyone who sneaked off behind his house to avoid participating was denounced by a neighbor and punished with a fine. And then Marie Chantal, who is a Tutsi survivor of the genocide, explains, the farmers were not rich enough, like the well-to-do city people, to buy themselves relief from killing. Some doctors and teachers in Kigali paid their servants or their employees so as not to dirty themselves. So in the 1994 Rwandan genocide, economic capital was a resource that some people were able to draw on to avoid participation. It was a transactional mechanism, the exchange of economic capital for the opportunity to not kill. In the context of extreme violence, this informed individuals' decisions about how to act. The reason why I think we see such a high correlation between poverty and participation in violence isn't necessarily because people are greedy and there's something they might gain, but it could also be because they don't have the resources to refuse, right? If you have money and someone says, you know, we're going to punish you with a fine for not participating, you say, okay, I don't care, here's $2,000, leave me alone. But if you don't have that money, you don't have that opportunity, it's much harder. So that's just one mechanism. A second finding from participants' reflections on what influenced their decisions about how to behave in the Rwandan genocide is that their relationships mattered. And of, of course, their relationships mattered. So in other words, their personal ties, their relationships, would influence when and for whom they were willing to use those resources. Are you going to use it for a stranger, or are you going to use it for your neighbor, or for a cousin, or for a sister-in-law, or for somebody that you know? So in the Rwandan genocide, given how high the risk of refusal was, civilians were unlikely to refuse participation unless they were asked to do so by someone who they cared about, whether as a family member, a friend, or a neighbor. And at the same time, this decision to risk defection in the Rwandan genocide was heavily shaped by the context that Hutu would find themselves in. So in particular, being very close, geographically close, to others who are participating in the violence would make it less likely that they would save because it was so dangerous. Um, when they were alone, when the people organizing the genocide was far away, were far away, it was much easier for them to do so because the risks of doing so were lessened. So as a result, the mechanism that explains this, um, there's actually this great historical sociologist, Chuck Tilly, who I named my dog after. Um, he defines this as alternations of connections among people, among groups, among networks. What I add to this is the idea that these alternations, in this case, are dependent on the context that you're in, and that context shapes the order of importance of your relationships in any given moment. So social ties are important for pulling people into participation, right? That was the mechanism we discussed before, peer pressure. People pull you in. But social ties are also important for pe pulling people away from participation in violence. And so as a result, social closeness isn't sufficient for explaining participation. We need to understand that closeness in the context that people are in. So here we have one respondent who describes killing his brother this way. And I just want to say, when we, when we argue that people participate in genocide because of deep-seated ethnic, racial, religious hatreds, in the Rwandan genocide, so many people killed their family members. There was 70% rate of intermarriage in Rwanda before the genocide. So when we say that there was always this deep-seated hatred, we're not doing justice to the real relationships that they had with each other and to how those were torn apart by the context of violence and war. So I'm just going to read this quote quickly. This man says, my older brother had a Tutsi wife. She was there at a church with her children. And when he went there, the head of the parish asked for food and beer. He went to get them at a center, but when he was at the center, the burgomaster, which is the mayor, came and said, where are you going with those things? And when my brother explained that the priest asked for food for the refugees, the mayor found the killers and they took him to kill my brother. The group did this, but my brother was not dead. He was in pain. The priest came to see what had happened. He then went back to the church. He went to get a car to bring my brother with him to the health center. And I went to visit my brother there. When I arrived, the burgomaster said, you, you've brought food for the Tutsis so that you do not begin again. You take a machete and you have to decapitate your brother. I refused, 
The burgomaster asked the reservist to force me to decapitate my brother, and he said if I refused, he would kill me. So the reservist took me and he gave me a machete. He put a gun behind my head and he said, if you do not cut, I will fire. So I cut. That is my crime. So here we see how the relationship between social ties and the, and the situation they're in, the spatial proximity, it's clear in testimonies by Rwandans who killed people close to them and Rwandans who saved people when they were physically distant from those who participated or were organizing the genocide. So as with other forms of high-risk mobilization, intimate relationships inform how you choose to act, and it maintains in a violent setting. So the relational mechanism argues that social networks are influenced by the context that you're in to explain the behavioral choices that you make. So I'm going to skip over this one, come back to something related to it in a moment, and I want to talk about what I call a cognitive mechanism, and I'm working a lot on, some, on this research right now, actually, um, with evidence from Nazis who participated in the Holocaust in Belarus, so that's a totally other project that I'm happy to talk about later. Um, but this fourth mechanism essentially suggests that timing really shaped whether or not people would align with the killing behaviors expected of them, and then dehumanization unfolded in the process as a result of that. And so this is really very important in Rwanda because many scholars will argue, like I mentioned earlier, that victimized civilians need to be dehumanized for perpetrators to kill them. And these works will look to things like racial epithets in state media before genocide, propaganda that describes victims as animals or insects for evidence that dehumanization has occurred. But, and I think we can all say this right now because we know that there are TV stations and radio stations that say horrible things about some of our fellow citizens, that does not necessarily convince us to believe them. So the mere fact that there is dehumanizing discourse and dehumanizing propaganda doesn't necessarily tell you how all civilians are responding to it, right? Because people can respond in a variety of ways. So it's contrary to what you might expect given the heavy emphasis of so much re research on propaganda before genocide. But even after extremists would enter their communities and they'd mobilize civilian Hutus to kill, their first few times participating in genocide were horrible. It was a horrible experience to kill another human being. For most people, that is a horrible experience. Um, and these Hutu, you can tell because it was so horrible, they fully recognized the humanness of those they were participating in violence against, or else they wouldn't have had that horrible reaction, right? And so they recognized the humanness of their victims, and they would struggle to cope with the consequences of their behaviors. And sometimes they would participate in violence as a way to save other Tutsi with whom they're close. So this shows that the decision making about who to save, who to kill, whether or not to kill, whether or not to save was very complicated early in the genocide. And they didn't see all Tutsi as one monolithic group of dehumanized others. So consider these following two quotes. The first one says, I asked the conseiller to help me and not touch my parents-in-law because I had just learned that Tutsis are being killed. He gave me conditions. On Wednesday, the gendarme came, and so did the conseiller, and everyone had guns. They showed us the road by which we had to attack, and they gave us directions. We began. When I approached the conseiller to save my parents-in-law, I was put among the people in front. I could not refuse this direction to lead. And another person explains, as many of us asked for our friends to be pardoned, the authorities gave us a condition. For these people to be left alone, we had to kill others on the list. So in these examples, victimized Tutsi were seen as individuals and their killers engage in these complex decision-making processes about how they would participate in genocidal violence given the pressures to do so. But over time, through participating in the violence, they stopped seeing their actions as murder, they stopped seeing their neighbors as equal, implying that there was a cognitive shift. That's why I call it a cognitive mechanism. There's a cognitive shift that took place in the process of participating in violence, where Hutu adapted to the action of killing, they got used to it, it became normalized, and their Tutsi peers became dehumanized others. So now we see these other quotes, where Jean-Baptiste, one of the people that we interviewed, explains, someone blocked me from behind and he shoved me forward with both elbows. 
When I saw the blood bubble up, I jumped back a step. I drew back. I never looked back in that unhappy direction. But later on, I got used to killing without so much dodging around. So he gets used to it. Fulgence, another participant in the genocide, says, we became more and more cruel, more and more calm, more and more bloody, but we did not see that we were becoming more and more killers. The more we cut, the more cutting became child's play to us. And then finally, Ignaz says, the Tutsi had become people to throw away, so to speak. They were no longer what they had been, and neither were we. So Hutu who participated in the Rwandan genocide repeatedly describe this process. And they say things like, man can get used to killing if he kills on and on. He can even become a beast without noticing it. And these statements mirror a lot of research on wartime violence and also research on the military, right? In which scholars argue that the experience of participating in combat can help raise your in-group interests for protecting us and override your pre-existing individual preferences. And as a result, even though a lot of people who study genocide say that victimized civilians have to be outside the moral universe of obligation for genocide to occur, my research finds that dehumanization is an outcome of ongoing participation in violence, as is adaptation to the process of violence itself. And this is both good and it's both bad. It's bad because it shows that people can kill without necessarily believing that the people they're killing are dehumanized others. They can kill for all these other reasons we discussed before. It's, it's good because it shows that if you intervene early, there's still opportunities. It shows that even if there's propaganda radio, not everyone necessarily believes it. It shows that people aren't gonna suddenly automatically think that their neighbors or their loved ones are horrible human beings just because some crazy person on the radio is telling you, right? So it's an important thing to keep in mind. There's a pro and a con to this. And I just, I think it's always helpful to try and complicate our understandings of human behavior in this way. So I understand if you're like, this is nuts. I object to her research. Um, <laughs> you know, this is just one case. How do we know it applies elsewhere? So I want to tell you a little bit about my work in France, and I'll leave the rest for the Q&A. So I am currently writing a book called Sacred Treason, How French Bishops Defected from Vichy to Save Jews During the Holocaust. And this book, in my opinion, it's about an amazing story of Catholic bishops who at first decided to support Vichy, decided to support the Nazis, decided to support violence against Jews, but then two years later they defected from their support for the regime in order to save Jews. So again, you have people shifting stances throughout the course of a war. And I know that many of you, ideally from walking around today um, or beforehand, have learned about the story of Protestants in the Chambos Solignon. So in case you haven't, I'm just going to briefly review what happened here. Um, so from December 1940 to September 1944, the residents of a small and rural French village called Le Chambon provided refuge for over 5,000 Jews who fled the Nazi occupation in some of the larger cities like, like Paris. And many scholars have tried to explain what made these Protestants and this entire community rescuers of Jews, what made them so unique. And people have suggested that they rescued them because as Protestants, they were a historically persecuted minority, and so they empathized with the plight of Jews. They understood what it felt like to be persecuted. And other approaches would say they were just uniquely exceptional, outstanding moral human beings. And other approaches would say that because Le Chambon was so far from the center of Nazi occupation and so rural, it was easier for them to rescue Jews because there weren't Nazis everywhere like you had in some of the major cities. But these reasons can't explain why Catholic bishops, not all, but some of them, made similar choices. Because pa Catholic bishops were, one, the majority religion in France at the time, two, they had already supported the Nazis, and three, the ones who protested on behalf of Jews came from some of the biggest cities like Paris, Lyon, Toulouse, Marseille, Nice. So they didn't have the so-called empathy from being a similarly persecuted minority. They weren't exclusively more moral human beings because they had already supported the Nazis, and they weren't safer because they weren't far removed from the Nazi occupation. So why did they do what they did? I'm gonna tell you a bit about the story from the very beginning. In May of 1940, how do I clear this arrow? All right, <laughs> sorry, it's fine. It says undo, clear. Yeah. Oh, 
There we go. All right. I like my pictures. I want to share them. Um, so in May of 1940, Germany invaded France. And in six weeks, the Wehrmacht reached Paris and the French government fled to Bordeaux. And they eventually ended up in Vichy, which is a spa town in central France from where the new authoritarian government would rule throughout World War II. And among the Vichy regime's very first decrees was the Statut des Juifs, the Jewish statute. And the Statut des Juifs was very similar to the Nuremberg laws. And that and other laws that followed would facilitate the incarceration the forced deportation, and the eventual mass murder of approximately 77,000 Jews from France. But before these laws were passed, specifically before the very first anti-Semitic statute was passed, the new Vichy government asked the Catholic Church whether or not this law would violate Christian principles. And the church met in August, and the Archbishop of Toulouse claimed that Vichy's position was incontestable from the viewpoint of Catholic doctrine. So again, why should we even care about the church? So consider this. The church's opinion was critical at the time because of the church's influence at the time. Not only was the new Vichy regime very religious on its own, but also you have the chaos of war, the chaos of violence. You know, churches were flooded throughout France as a result because people were seeking guidance from their religious leaders about how to respond to the unfolding crisis of the war that was happening around them. So one historian says that Catholicism became the single most cohesive force in French society after Germany defeated France. And you can look at this picture of Sacred Heart at the top of Montmartre in Paris, which is just one example of the remarkable power the church had to influence public opinion because of its popularity at the time. So the church was the moral authority in France at the time, and Catholic bishops, when they decided to support Vichy's anti-Semitic laws in August 1940, this was a very powerful legitimation of state-sponsored violence and discrimination. And again, I just want to pause because I think it's always important to highlight contemporary events. When you see religious leaders supporting violent regimes or supporting violent policies, that matters. It mattered in Rwanda when people looked to their local leaders. It mattered in the Holocaust in France. It matters in all these episodes of violence you're seeing around you. Religious authorities, moral leaders, have remarkable power to shape how civilians are trying to understand when your governments are saying and wanting to do terrible things. So here you have the church. They're supporting the Statue des Juifs. They're saying it's incontestable from the viewpoint of Catholic doctrine. And then two years later, August 1942, a subset of bishops defects from this stance. They all walk up to their pulpits on a cold and breezy Sunday and they claim the following, that children, that women, fathers, and mothers be treated like cattle, that members of a family be dispatched, separated from one another, and dispatched to an unknown destination. It has been reserved for our own time to see such a sad spectacle. The Jews are real men and women. They cannot be abused without limit. They are a part of the human species. They are our brothers. And this protest was a critical turning point for the history of the Holocaust in France. Archbishop Saliège, the same bishop I quoted earlier, now insisted that all priests under his authority read this letter. It was eventually read from over 400 pulpits in France. It was broadcast by the BBC. And these bishops who protested, they inspired other Catholic clergy members to follow them, writing up their own letters, their own protests in their diocese from 1942 and onwards. And in the end, French bishops' protest would help kick the French resistance into gear and mobilize thousands of Catholics throughout the country to try and save Jews. Actually, in the end, I think out of any occupied country in the Holocaust, France has the second largest number of righteous Gentiles. That's something to keep in mind. So I look at this history. I'm a sociologist, so I flipped it around, and I turned it into the central puzzles of my project. The first question is, why did French bishops decide to endorse the Statue des Juifs? So how do people choose to support state violence? And the second question is, well, how did they then decide to protest on behalf of Jews in August 1942? How do people choose to resist state violence? And these questions align with the research I'm asking in Rwanda and in other places, which is, how is it that people with no pre-existing history of support for state violence choose to mobilize and endorse it? And how do they decide to resist at other moments? And though the writing of my book is in process, I can tell you a little bit about why they supported the Nazis to begin with. 
I can tell you about why it mattered. Um, in the q and I'll tell you about my initial findings on why they resisted, but I, I'm going to save that for the Q&A because it's something I'm still working on, and I'll just say that I'm going back to France this summer because I have some answers, but I want to validate them with more data. So first of all, what do people say about this? You always have to say what's been written on this topic, right? So many scholars have sought to explain why bishops supported the Vichy regime's alliance with Nazis in the first place and why people who support genocide more generally. You have you know, the emphasis on ideology, on prejudice, on hatred, on deep-seated anti-Semitism. So this ideological theory suggests that individuals support state violence because they have these deep-rooted hatreds against the others. Um, they have prejudiced beliefs towards victimized civilians. And applied to France, historians will suggest that French bishops were either privately anti-Semitic, and that's why they endorsed the statute, <coughs> or that French bishops believed that the Nazi invasion and subsequent occupation of France was divine retribution for a country that had lost its core values and could only be saved by a reunion of church and state. So I also just want to mention that the prime minister of France um, in the 30s, before the Holocaust happened, was Jewish. So a lot of people don't know that. I think it's a cool thing to know. Um, so in the words of one historian, an example of the ideological argument, Traditional Catholic circles were particularly exposed to the contagion of anti-Semitism because of the persistence of old anti-Judaism and religious ties that continued to unite Catholic and right-wing circles that, continue, uh, that were hostile to Republic secularism, to, uh, to the Republic and secularism. And this anti-Semitism, which was social and economic and political, persisted and worsened during the crisis of French defeat, and it led to increasing xenophobia. So this is the ideological argument. But there's a second argument that's also often made about why individuals support genocide, and that's because there's, there's opportunity in it. There's something they can gain from it. So here are the ideas that people mobilize to hurt others or to limit their rights because in ways they think they might benefit from those actions. That, or they're simply so blindsided by the benefits that can be gained that they just don't even think about their actions as wrong. So applied to France, historians will argue that the church was so excited by this new possibility of reuniting church and state under the new authoritarian Vichy regime that bishops just forgot about Jews. So one scholar writes that in the new France, the church felt it had the wind in its sails and the first Jewish statue aroused little interest. Or another historian explains, the first Jewish statue aroused little interest, Catholic leaders said nothing, while the Catholic Church in France enthusiastically supported Vichy because its themes of contrition, sacrifice, and suffering resonated with the church, and not since the 1870s had the church seen a greater opportunity to advance its interests. Again, these arguments aren't wrong, and it's not surprising that scholars, historians, have identified ideology and interest-based motivations to explain why the church supported Vichy anti-Semitism in the early years in the war. This time period in France was totally overwhelming, super crazy upheaval, right? You imagine a foreign government comes in, takes over, takes over your country. It's a major crisis. And scholars argue, sociologists will argue, that in times of crisis, you see both extremes of the moral integrity spectrum, right? Opportunistic ambitions on one hand, ideology on the other hand, right? But in the middle of these two poles, for a lot of people, there was a lot of confusion. So bishops who compromised the episcopate and were responsible for deciding on the statute felt all these ways. You had some people who were deeply anti-Semitic. You had some people who thought that they could gain a lot. And you had a lot of people who were confused. And this matters because it indicates that even though individuals might have had ideological dispositions beforehand that made them more inclined to support Vichy, and others might have been eager to support Vichy because of what they thought they could gain, there were also people in between, and neither of those perspectives explains those people in between, nor how the church as an organization came together and decided to support the statute. So how all these people with different perspectives actually aligned around a common stance of support for state violence against Jews. So for this, to answer this question, I again question this link between identity and violence and I suggest that we should focus on the moment of the decision, how people make their choices. And that's because, again, I know I'm, I'm repeating this lesson, but I think it's so important. Whether you're a Hutu or a Nazi or a Catholic or any other category of person that is expected to support a genocidal regime, that doesn't tell you about the actual choices people make. 
You might be expected to do something, but whether or not you do it is another, is another matter altogether. So when you focus on the moment of decision, we can actually parse out if identity matters, how identity matters, and how it shapes decision-making and violence. So to determine how bishops decide to endorse the Statut de Juif, I spent 15 months collecting documents from archives in France, in Israel, in the United States. And this is notes and letters and diaries and meeting minutes and private correspondences between many different bishops, between bishops and Jewish community leaders, between bishops with the Vatican or with representatives of the Vatican. Um, and this was collected from the French National Archives, French Diplomatic Archives, the Shoah Memorial Archives in Paris, um, the Comte de Mille Memorial Site in Aix-en-Provence, um, from the US Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, DC, from Yad Vashem, where I met my husband of all places. <laughs> So in examining this data, what I did was I paid close attention to both the subjective, right, the private feelings that bishops had, and the interactive dimensions, how their feelings changed depending on who they were interacting with, and how this overall influenced their decision making. So this means I didn't only pay attention to what they wrote to each other and what they said in various public statements, but I also pay attention to what they didn't say, and who they didn't say things to, and why. So I was atten paying attention to the power dynamics in their correspondences. I looked at when they were willing to express their ideas publicly and when they kept them private. Um, one of the most interesting things for me was reading their diaries. A lot of them kept diaries. Um, and let me tell you, this probably isn't shocking to anyone in the room, but a lot of times what people probably privately felt and how they publicly acted were two very different things. Um, and we know this, we know that people are like this, a lot of us are like this, we do things we don't necessarily want to do for a whole variety of reasons. So I started my analysis in 1933, and this is when Hitler was appointed to the Chancellor of Germany. And contrary to a lot of the research, I find that many bishops were very outspoken on behalf of Jews from 1933 to 1939. But public denunciations of Hitler, of Nazism, of anti-Semitism, they were made by some of the most important church authorities in France, including in Paris, Marseille, Nice, Toulouse, and Lyon, but they declined over time. So we see here, red men on the map, that represents where all these bishops were protesting on behalf of Jews once Hitler came to power in Germany. And here's an example of some of the things they would say. Processes of intolerance, sectarianism, and persecution for religious reasons, no matter where they come from and the denomination they are against, should provoke a universal reprobation from all honest people. It is necessary that all men of righteous heart and loyal soul with the cult of moral and spiritual forces unite to protest against such violations of freedom of conscience, against oppression, the victims of which today are Israelites from Germany. So this is 1933, the Bishop of Nice speaking out on behalf of Jews. And this declaration and others like it complicate this dominant historical narrative because it's clear that French bishops held a variety of perspectives from 1933 and 1940. And it means that ideas translate into action, ideology as the motivation for supporting state violence can't be the only reason why they supported the Statut de Juif. Diversity prevailed among bishops' attitudes and so as a result, we can dismiss the first argument that says ideology was the only reason why church and state came together and against Jews. But this forces the question, what happened to cause a shift from outspoken people like this, like Monsignor Ramond in Nice, to committed support for state anti-Semitism by the same bishop and his colleagues only a few years later? So in other words, how did they converge around a common support, common stance of support for state violence? So my first findings suggest that the transformation of the context and its impact on the church was necessary to alter French bishops' opinions. And specifically, the very first significant transformation to affect the church was the deaths of two of its most prominent actors. So in February 1939, Pope Pius XI died. He was an outspoken advocate for Jews. In 1937, he published a papal encyclical that actually spoke out against anti-Semitism and in 1939, he was preparing one that was focused specifically on Jews. The one in 1937 was against Hitler, against racism, against xenophobia. The one in 1939 was specifically about Jews. He died before it could ever be published. And then, oh, sorry. Evidence indicates that bishops throughout France took note of this change. 
So in June 1940, one month after Germany invaded France, a senior cardinal in Rome wrote to Cardinal Suhard in Paris that he was afraid that history may be obliged to blame the Holy See for a policy that is only accommodated to its own advantage. So they knew there was a change. They were aware that this was not good. And this change in the papal leadership meant that the most prominent leader in the, French, in the Roman Catholic Church <laughs> shifted his stance towards Nazism. And this was important for Catholics everywhere. But it was especially important in France, where the church also lost Cardinal Verdier. And Cardinal Verdier was the Archbishop of Paris. He was one of the most outspoken bishops on behalf of Jews. This is his New York Times obituary. He was known as a champion of the oppressed and as a foe of dictators. And he even attended meetings for the League of Human Rights with rabbis and French mayors in the months before his death in April 1940. So my first point is that when Pope Pius XI died, and when Cardinal Vaudier died shortly after, the institutional anchors of the church changed, and that had tremendous consequences for how French bishops would understand the situations that they were experiencing. And in particular, the new church authorities, Pope Pius XII, would alter bishops' understandings of the realms of possibility and constraint, what they could or couldn't do with church support. So in May 1940, less than one month after Cardinal Verdier died, Germany invaded France. And reactions among contemporaries, described by contemporaries, have been described as total shock, disarray, that the French were stupefied, they were stunned. But likewise, and less often knowledge, is that the church was in disarray as well. So not only had there been a sudden death in the leadership of the church, but also churches throughout the country were bombed and destroyed. And furthermore, France, and therefore the church, was divided into two. So a third of clergy was in the army, other priests were acting as chaplains outside the diocese, and then you have, pardon me, the demarcation line, which separates France in half, and that starts in Lake Geneva, it extends to Tours, southwards to Spain, and communication across the demarcation line was prohibited. So as a result, my second point is that external shocks, right, situational larger things caused by the war, divided the church, and it caused bishops' organizational norms we're going to a meeting, we know who says what, we know who's going to communicate, we have a system of hierarchy, we have a system of leadership. Those were totally disarrayed. Bishops couldn't communicate with each other in normal channels. They couldn't call each other on the phone. They couldn't drive to meet each other. They couldn't write each other letters without fearing that they would be read by the Nazis. And so now when they had to decide on the statut de juif, they couldn't communicate with each other normally, so they had to rely on these other signals I'm going to talk about in a moment. So my third data point concerns how the division of France impacted some of the most prominent bishops in the church in distinct ways. Because first in the occupied zone, three weeks after France and Germany signed the armistice, the new bishop of Paris, Cardinal Suhard, who took over for Cardinal Verdier, he's young, he's new to the job, he's followed home from mass by a group of Nazi officers. They destroyed his home, they arrested him, they locked him in the kitchen for four days, they kept him in total isolation. And when Suhard asked, why are you detaining me? The Nazis said that they knew of a plot that he was supposedly hatching against the Reich. But the questions, so and this is, you know, Suhard asked the Nazis, this is what they say. But the questions that the Nazis asked him tell us even more. Because when they were searching his home and confiscating all his documents, the Gestapo turned to Suhard and they said, what do you know about the Judeo-Masonic activities of Cardinal Verdier? This is his predecessor, right? What do you know about his support for Jews? So trying to figure out the cardinal stance for Jews was critical for the Nazis. They wanted to prevent him from following in Verdier's footsteps. And they wanted to limit any outspokenness on behalf of Jews by the new authority of the French Catholic Church. And Cardinal Suhard, in response, began to quiet his rhetoric. And this repression would have grave implications for how the association of cardinals and archbishops decided on the statute two weeks later. Simultaneously, oh, pardon me. This is a picture of Cardinal Suhard. So simultaneously, in the free zone, Cardinal Gurlier individually saw opportunities to collaborate with the new regime. So here you have someone who is very highly opportunis opportunistic. He was the only cardinal in unoccupied France, and he was the official representative to the Catholic, for the Catholic Church to the new regime as a result. But his efforts at negotiation weren't unanimously supported by the church. 
And in fact, when he received permission from the Nazis to cross the demarcation line to meet with the bishops in occupied France, others expressed that they were very frustrated and concerned, and they disagreed with his approach of trying to negotiate and work with the Vichy authorities. So on July 10, 1940, Cardinal Suhard signed a letter with Gurlier and others, and in this letter they claimed that the stance of the church was unanimous. But that same day, Suhard writes privately in his diary that he had little faith in Gurlier's aspirations. He wrote, many words, few ideas. What is the point of this whole enterprise? I have little confidence. So again, someone acting in a way and privately not believing in what they're doing. And then you have Cardinal Gurlier, who made countless public statements of support for the Vichy regime. And many people have interpreted his statements as indicative of the entire church's stance in aligning with Vichy in the early years of the war. So this discounts all these backstage divisions and dissent, especially by those in the occupied zone. For example, Cardinal Gurlier's most famous quote from July 9th, 1940, was that Pétain is France, and France today is Pétain. Almost every book, every movie you see about the French Catholic Church during the Holocaust will quote this quote. However, if we look beyond these public statements to church officials' private notes and diaries, it's clear that not everyone agreed with his attitude and with his open praise for Pétain. So again, in contrast to a portrayal of the Catholic Episcopate as unified in its eagerness to herald the start of this new regime, and as with the earlier argument about ideology, we can dismiss the theory that selfish interests brought the church and state together and against Jews. It did for some, but not for all. And we can say, to an extent, absolutely, Suhard's selfish interest in protecting himself and protecting his church was one of the reasons why he remained silent, but this is different from an interest in seeing how much they could gain by aligning with Vichy, right? And in contrast, you have Grelier, who's clearly interested in obtaining benefits from the new regime by praising Pétain, but his stance was not the unanimous one. So how did they converge among the, around this common position of support? So the first meeting to decide on the statute was August 28, 1940. It was in occupied France, and Cardinal Suhard, who had just been arrested by the Nazis, was presiding over it. And although French bishops were given this permission to meet by the Nazis, they were told they were only allowed to discuss spiritual concerns. So when Cardinal Gurlier convened the second meeting three days later in unoccupied France, the, de the desires of the church that they transmitted from Suhard to Gurlier were a need for unity, a need for caution, and for prudence in case of any contingency. And this meant increasing repression by Nazis. Importantly, the Jewish question was not discussed in this meeting. And this was despite the fact that the French government specifically asked them to talk about it. They wanted to know, was it legitimate from a Catholic perspective to discriminate against Jews? But does this mean that they just forgot about it? That they were, you know, were complacent? That that didn't occur to them, even though this was an assignment that they were given? Well, the evidence shows no. And in fact, in Bishop's letters and in their diaries, I find how frustrated they are at their silence concerning the Statue des Juifs. So these bishops would write about feeling afraid that they're being wiretapped by the Nazis. And so the best expression I found of this is perhaps by Cardinal Baudrillard, uh, sorry, who wrote in his diary during the meetings, in silence and fortitude shall we retain our strength. In contrast, in occupied France, Bishop's strategies, sh oh sorry, not in contrast, we're still in occupied France. Bishop's strategies shifted from outspoken denunciation of Hitler, of racism, of anti-Semitism, to silence. They didn't stop caring. They didn't forget about their previous commitments, but they feared the consequences. So silence to them meant fortitude. It was courage under fire. But in contrast, at the start of the meeting of the ACA in unoccupied France, and here we have Grelier who's presiding over this, he specified that the goal of the conference was to study together the most urgent questions that were facing religious life in the unoccupied zone. Thirteen orders were on the list of issues to be discussed at the meeting, and the Jewish question was ninth. When it came to discuss the Jewish question, Grelier began, severe provisions will undoubtedly soon be decided against the Jews. And he then said, a brief report outlines the principles that must guide the Christian attitude. The report which is anonymously written, is titled A Note on Anti-Semitism, 
reflections on some themes to guide a Christian in the issues raised by the recurrence of anti-Semitism in the contemporary world. And in it, we see <coughs> authors struggling over how they should classify a population that they believe is distinct and different in some way. And we see that they want to distinguish their perspective from the Nazi belief system, from this racist belief system, while still articulating what they thought was an important distinction between Jews and the rest of France. And so the report negates various kinds of anti-Semitism. They say, oh, we don't believe in political anti-Semitism. We don't believe in hate-filled anti-Semitism. But what they do say is that the nature of the problem is not racial, it's not national, it's spiritual. And it's spiritual, they argue, because Jews all over the world are connected to each other. And as a result, it's impossible for them to assimilate. And the authors say that this refusal to assimilate surpasses all explanation, and the result is that Jews are a thorn in the flesh of nations, and that allows the state, as a guardian of the general interest, to have a right and a duty to ensure that this shared spiritual feeling among Jews doesn't harm the good of the country. And in the end, this is the exact same language that the church used to justify the Statut de Juif in its meeting minutes of August 1940. And I just want to point out, this idea that Jews are unassimilable, that they're connected to each other all over the country, it's absolutely anti-Semitic. Mm -hmm. It is also an argument that modern day politicians make about other people who they think cannot be assimilated in our midst. So think about these arguments. I mean, this isn't just the past, it's currently relevant as well. Um, and obviously I feel it's very important to keep highlighting. So Gurlier wrote the meeting minutes of the ACA, and in it he explained the church's position as follows. He said, on the one hand, there's the fact of the existence of an international Jewish community to which all Jews of all nations are attached, and that can oblige a state to take protective measures in the name of the common good. But on the other hand, a state cannot brutally hunt Jews and deny them their natural rights. It might seem legitimate from a state to imagine a particular legal status for Jews. But the statute must be guided by rules of justice and charity. And this exact language, there's going to be a separate category. They're going to be a separate category of citizens, but guided by justice and charity, whatever that means. Um, that was parroted by Vichy Foreign Minister Paul Bedouin when the law was passed and he was interviewed by American newspapers. So what can this result tell us about how people make decision in violent contexts? I want to emphasize silence speaks volumes. And in particular, the silence of powerful and prominent people speaks volumes, and it has power to, st to sway entire trajectories of political events with profound consequences for history. And the consideration of the relationship between silence and status helps to explain the story. Because although the institutional structure of the church was undergoing rapid changes, and even though organizational norms to guide bishops' communication were unclear, the fact that there were still positions of authority, they still existed, it provided a focal point that bishops could look to to try and determine what the safest stance was. What are our leaders going to do? This is what they're doing. They're not saying anything. We're not going to say anything either. This is what they're doing. They're protesting. We're going to protest too. So as best as I can discern from the meeting minutes of the ACA, combined with private notes of some bishops in attendance, Prominent church authorities had disproportionate sway over how decision-making occurred in the Episcopate in 1940, and this was because of their status. So Cardinal Suhart in Paris, very high-ranked authority, Cardinal Gurlier in Lyon, also a high-ranked authority, had the most prominent positions in the Episcopate on their respective sides of the demarcation line when the Statue de Juif was decided on. In occupied France, Cardinal Suhart encouraged silence, and silence followed. He may have seen it as an act of resistance, but it enabled the status of Cardinal Grolier and his support for the Statue de Juif to take sway, to take hold, and to shape the ultimate position of the church. So in unoccupied France, Cardinal Grolier marshaled a variety of perspectives towards the statue. He summarized it in a report. He said that the principles of the report must guide the Christian attitude, and no one, as far as I can tell, voiced any dissent. So again, it's so important to speak out. <laughs> As a result, I suggest that when lower ranking bishops were unclear of what stance to take vis-a-vis -vis the statute, close observation of these prominent bishops' cues was critical for setting the trajectory of the church in motion. And crucially, this included the silence of the bishops, 
as a kind of statement and a powerful clue for how to align and not only the prominent positions of bishops in the free zone. So what I argue here is that silence is endorsement and furthermore silence is interpreted as endorsement when the same high status authority has spoken out on similar issues in the past but he or she chooses to remain silent in the present. And finally, if others who are similarly ranked claim to speak on your behalf, if you're an authority and someone says that they're speaking and this is a common agreement, and that authority is expected from past behavior to publicly speak out as well, and that person chooses to remain silent, then that silence is just as important as the declarations of their prominent peers in shaping a group's collective decision. In contrast, if a single high status authority individual were to speak out, this could be disruptive enough to stall the process of consensus formation overall. So I'm gonna stop here. I really feel free to ask me about how they defected in the end because there's so many cool elements to the story, but I wanna emphasize a few things, a few lessons from today. First, from my work in Rwanda, we learned that people who participate in genocide don't always and only participate in genocide, but sometimes they save people too. And because of this, if we look to the reasons why people shift stances throughout the course of a conflict, we can actually start to think of opportunities for intervention. So the first finding, for example, that people often participate because they're too poor to refuse otherwise, suggests that economic development is very important for mitigating violence. And we should target companies in places like Myanmar, places like Democratic Republic of Congo, that are profiting from violence by providing funding for violent regimes. This is something I wrote about in the Washington Post on January 26, 2018, so feel free to look that up for an idea of how it could work in process, in practice. Second, the finding that dehumanization is part of the process of ongoing participation in violence, and it doesn't necessarily happen beforehand, it shows how important it is to intervene early in genocide. We should absolutely try and limit as much hatred on radio and media and TV and airways as possible, but also, if it ever gets to a point where violence is happening, we need to intervene early. I mean, we have tremendous opportunities by doing so. When people are still hesitant to participate and they're trying to figure out what to do, that early intervention is crucial. And then third, one finding that undergirds both of my projects is that local leaders are really important for shaping how civilians make decisions. So in Rwanda, much like in France, people look to their religious leaders, they look to mayors, they look to the police to figure out what to do. And in fact, there are several communities in Rwanda where absolutely no genocide happened at all. Zero, no one was killed. And that's because the mayor and the religious leaders spoke up against it and they said, we are not gonna do this. And that is so important for shaping trajectories of violence. So like the results of my research in France, in places where local <coughs> leaders speak up, no genocide happens or less genocide happens and people are saved. In places where leaders remain silent, you have the same results as places where leaders spoke up to support the violence. So leadership matters, speaking up matters. And I wanna tell this part of the story today because at a time where so many people are being victimized by the current government, where people are suffering, where people are afraid, it's important to speak up against it. So I wanna leave you with this one quote from Cardinal Saliège who ended up defecting and narrating that beautiful protest we read earlier and he triggered this protest that would result in France saving the second largest number of Jews from any occupied country during the Holocaust. And it's as follows. It is not just print that counts. Silence speaks, dead silence, dignified silence, silence of maturity, silence of meditation, silence of caution, silence of servants. Silence is an act. What is the nature of your silence? Thank you. <laughs> We're going to give the floor um, for question and answers. I just want to add to that. Um, I, it reminds me of, I was at the March for Our Lives um, in New York several weekends ago, and one of the most resonant signs for me as a Holocaust scholar was there was a student who had a sign quoting, 
um, the, the Auschwitz survivor, Ellie Wiesel, and it specifically said, um, silence always hurts the victims and it empowers the oppressor. So I, I love that you ended with um, such a resonant quote there. That's great. So we're going to mm -hmm. open yeah. up the floor. You're welcome to take whatever questions. And we really want to okay. encourage our students <laughs> in the group to ask questions if it'll help with an assignment or um, you can link back to things you're doing in your classes. We also want to get some student voices. Okay. I know you've um, had an okay. eager I, I question. I just wanted to say, uh, uh, mm -hmm. give a footnote to the idea of France. Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, the Catholic Church as an entity reflected the sentiments of the population in which it existed, with the major exception of Italy, mm -hmm. where the church was anti-Semitic, but the population wasn't. Mm -hmm. Now, in France, you also had a situation where a good many Frenchmen, regardless of their sentiments towards the Jews, hated the Germans. Mm -hmm. And they also had Laval, who was the prime minister. Uh, no matter how anti-Semitic he was, put his foot down that you could not deport citizens of France. You could deport the, the refugees, but not, not the citizens. The other thing is this. There were Catholics in, in major positions that were actually with de Gaulle, the head of the Free French Navy during the Second World War, was the head of the Carmelite Order in France, whose name was uh, Admiral Georges Thierry d'Argenier, and after the war he went back to be the head of the Carmelites in France. Mm -hmm. But I would also suggest another thing. France is not, in my opinion, France is not a good uh, area to examine the position of the bishops. If you were to go to Germany to examine the position of the bishops, Gordon Zahn, who was Catholic and who was a professor at Loyola University, wrote a very, very important book, German Catholics and Hitler's Wars. Mm -hmm. There wasn't one person of the rank of bishop in Germany, Catholic bishop, who protested the Holocaust. On the other hand, there were bishops in Germany who praised the Holocaust. Cardinal Beltram, who was the dean of the cardinals in Germany. Is there a question? No, <laughs> but, but a person can make a comment. Yeah, All right? So I'm, I'm, I'm saying, other, I'm saying that, arms, that the yeah, issue also. should really be, there are other countries that would be a better idea to, uh, uh, to, to, to explore the attitude yeah. of the Catholic Church. Thank you. Was there a particular reason why you focused on Vichy France? Yeah, um, you know, the particular reason why I focused on Vichy France, and so with regards to your comment that there's other places that are better to study, is it was a great place to study my particular question, which wasn't why did some people support and why did some people resist, but why did the same people support and resist at the same, you know, over time they shifted their stances. And this is a really great example. You know, you are totally right. In Germany, you had many people who refused and were against the Nazis from the very beginning. You had many people who supported the Nazis, but in France, you have the exact same people shifting their stances. So for me, that was a great place to look at this specific question of variation. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. With Rwanda, what was the spark? The, well, what was the historical background that started this genocide? Mm -hmm. Because it doesn't seem to be clear. Well, all of a sudden, out of the blue, Hutus were killing Tutsis. Yes. Can you give us the, a little bit of the historical I'll give background? you a very brief historical background. So under colonialism, you had the creation of these racial categories that essentially fixed the identities of Hutu and Tutsi. So it used to be in Rwanda that if you were a Hutu and you had more than eight cows, I think it was eight, you would become a Tutsi. Um, it was tied to economic class. But then you had these Belgian colonizers who came in and they created these ideas of Tutsi as taller, leaner, thinner, more refined, more educated, naturally more intelligent. They were white people with black skin, was what they were saying. And Hutu were essentially you know, a lower category and a lower class of people. So you have the creation of these racial cleavages. Then you have the revolution that overthrows the colonial government, essentially, and overthrows the Tutsi, who had been working in service of the colonial government. So you have Hutu power, Hutu dominance, from that point forward. And a lot of Tutsi ended up fleeing the country to Uganda because they were afraid. You know, there was, they were trying to overthrow them because they had worked in the service of the government. So in the 1990s, what you essentially had was Tutsi 
who were Tutsi refugees in, your, in Uganda who started making incursions into Rwanda and triggering a civil war because they wanted to take back the country which they claimed was rightfully theirs. And so Tutsi keep coming back. You have a Hutu extremist government in power. The president gets killed. It's actually very similar. We have a leader who gets killed immediately before the war begins. And people start saying, all Tutsi want to take over our country. If we're ever going to have security, we have to get rid of them. So you have a context of civil war in which people are trying to take over a country and claim it as their own. And that the extremists use that to mobilize people to say, we're never going to have peace and security in our country until we get rid of every last Tutsi. So that's a very, very brief overview. Thank you. Uh, yes. Just very quickly, um, in, in reference to that question, wasn't there in Rwanda like some sort of a plane crash that precipitated and some leaders of countries were killed? And that I remember listening to this on the radio, and it seemed to me it had that event, and next thing you know, there's all sorts of killings and mass mm -hmm. murders. You know. yeah, yeah, absolutely. So that was the president's plane that crashed in August 1994. And the second his plane crashed, and the reason why we can claim so easily that it was genocide is they had been organizing way before the president's clash to take over. So a major debate that's happening right now in Rwanda and between France as well, actually, is who shot, who, who killed the president, who you know fired at the plane. We still don't know. Some people say that it was um, the Rwandan, the Hutu extremists killed their own Hutu president because they thought he was being too willing to negotiate with Tutsi. Some people say the Tutsi killed him because they wanted to take over the country. Okay. One other very quick thing. Um, in France, um, what about Pope Pius XII? Okay, because I know that there was, a, there was a, an effort to maybe declare him to be a saint by the Catholic Church, and some Jewish organizations claimed that his silence really mitigated against that. Could you just talk a little bit about that? Yes. So I will say my biggest fear as a historical sociologist is I'm going to publish the book, and then for the first time in all of history, the Vatican secret archives will open up for this time point. <laughs> and we'll have all the answers that we never knew before. So some people are saying maybe this pope, the current pope, will um, make those archives public. I think it's from... I don't remember the exact time period, but essentially the 1930s, 1945, completely blocked out. So what I have is radio messages from Vatican Secret Radio. I have letters and messages. I was going to say emails, obviously not emails. <laughs> I have letters sent back and forth between representatives of the Vatican and you know Vatican diplomats and the French bishops but I have nothing from Pope Pius II himself. I have people writing about what he said. I have people describing what he said in their meetings. Um, we know that he supported their silence. He encouraged their silence. I don't know what happened after that, and it's all, you know. Um, obviously, my particular stance is silence in general from the most important religious authority in the world is a <laughs> terrible thing, so. Hi, I just want to thank you for coming all the way from California. Of course. <laughs> Great presentation. Thank you. I got to see my family. <laughs> my uh, American government class is reading one of your articles that we uh, took off the internet in which you introduced the concept of social debt. Mm. I was wondering if you could Thanks for reading that. That's like a very, I think it's in Jewish social studies, so it's kind of an obscure. Thank you. I have a lot of time on my hands. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've been talking about it in class. And I, w I want to ask you, uh, is social death where discriminated groups are dehumanized, mm -hmm. is that always a precursor to genocide, which seems to me going to the final step of literal death? Mm -hmm. And today you mentioned that moment of decision when supposedly a normal person decides to participate in a genocide. Mm -hmm. Does social death set up that decision? Because uh, I would argue uh, Germans were discriminating against Jews and, and uh, putting forth social death upon Jews, not only, only for decades, but for centuries mm -hmm. before the Holocaust happened. Right. Would you agree? Yeah, I, I mean, so this is, uh, I'm working on this right now, but a paper on this right now, but yes, like this is so important because a lot of people, like I said, will look to propaganda for evidence of dehumanization before genocide, and it is absolutely critically important. I mean, this plays a role, but what it plays a role in doing is not motivating people to kill, but when people kill and they feel 
horrible about it the first few times, they can look to this propaganda to justify to themselves why they're doing what they're doing. And then over time, as they get used to it, they come to believe it, right? So I don't, the fact of the matter is there is social death practices and processes all over the world all the time, but not everyone's always killing their neighbors. So other things have to happen too. But I do think that once the killing begins, it plays a very important legitimizing role. So once you do start believing in it, it is very hard to stop because you can convince yourself that you're a good human being and that what you're doing is the right thing. You're protecting your country by getting rid of these dangerous, awful, evil outsiders. But it doesn't provide the only or necessarily the initial impetus to kill. I think it plays a much bigger role in the process, which is why it's so dangerous, because it, it's a justifying narrative, right? So. Yeah, ask me. I teach students all the time. Ask me questions. <laughs> question for you from a researcher perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that we all have these kind of maybe preconceived notions or stereotypes if we hear that an individual was a perpetrator of genocide or that someone was a victim or a survivor. So I'm assuming that for your research in Rwanda that you had the opportunity to actually interview mm -hmm. perpetrators. So. Um, I guess my question to you is how do you mentally kind of prepare yourself for something like that and also um, try to go into the situation without those preconceived notions because there has to be some level of trust or connecting with the person for them to open up to you and reveal things? Yeah, that's a really good question. So there is no denying I was very afraid the moment, yeah. the first time I stepped foot in a Rwandan prison. Um, and the other thing is a lot of these people were the same age as me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm 34 now, I guess I was, is that 10 years ago, geez. Isn't that, I'm getting old. <laughs> um, I was young. Uh, I am a very sensitive person. Um, I think I'm naturally just highly empathetic. And so I was very, very scared going in, but when you sit down face to face with someone and they're telling you about the most horrible decision they've ever made in their lives, it's really hard not to feel bad mm -hmm. and not to then open up your heart and try and understand a bit more about why they did what they did. Um, so that helped me, you know, it really broke down those barriers. Mm -hmm. I can't pretend those barriers weren't there. I tried to train myself as much as possible to be there, to listen. But when you're sitting with someone who's in prison for the rest of their lives because of a terrible thing they did when they were 18 years old um, or 17 years old, it's very hard not to just say, well, like, you know, you're talking about killing your brother. That's, I can't imagine, that's the worst thing I can possibly imagine, you know? And so um, that, I think, would help break down those barriers, that human-to-human -human interaction. And it's like in everyday life, too, right? You have preconceived notions about people. But when you sit down with someone and you have an open-hearted conversation, it helps you build a connection with them and then actually really try and listen to what they're saying. Do you think it also played a role that they had already been incarcerated? So, yeah. for instance, you read um, cases of researchers who go to Rwanda and um, the individuals that they're interviewing are very coy or they're not clear or right, forthcoming about mm -hmm. what they were doing, yeah. um, you know, when the genocide occurred. So mm -hmm. how much of the fact that they had been presumably found guilty or they were already incarcerated, how much do you think that played a role in their willingness to share um, their participation yeah. with you? I think as a researcher, that's always a challenge because, again, these are people who are in prison, so they're under certain constraints, and they've already admitted to their guilt, so they might have had time to reflect on their story, mm -hmm. to prepare their story in a particular way for what the trial was. Um, so it's something I'm very sensitive to. So in my research, I try and cross-reference it with other interviews done by other scholars mm -hmm. to see if they're finding similar patterns. So the more patterned behavior and reasoning we can find, whether it's me or someone else or another person, um, the more valid our results are, you know, but there's always going to be that issue with post hoc explanations of participation in genocide. Yeah. Yeah.
I, thank you so much for coming thank this you. distance. It was wonderful. <laughs> I think that you said something very important that I think has um, great import for our students, mm -hmm. which is that this is relevant today. Mm -hmm. And I really, really appreciate that. It's been relevant through history. Um, mm -hmm. In the Dominican Republic, when mm -hmm. Trujillo was a despot, the bishops got together mm -hmm. and they put out a message. And it sounds like a smaller mm -hmm. version of this. Mm -hmm. but, but back to today, I'm wondering um, if you've looked at or could talk about, you don't need data. <laughs> um, <laughs> the implications of what you're talking about for our criminal justice system today, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in that a killer is not always a killer. Oh, sure. And, and I'm also specifically thinking about these are kind of two separate topics, gangs, right. and the way that um, children are brought into gangs very much the way people um, were brought into the Nazi youth and, mm -hmm. and in Rwanda, and that a killer is not always a killer. And do you think that your research could be used to speak to this problem in America today? Yeah, so first of all, in um, I don't think so. My third mechanism, which is social psychological, in the actual paper that I published based on this, I make direct references to the gang violence literature because this idea of proximity is so crucial and, and not being able to leave an environment where people are trying to co-opt you and pull you into violence mm -hmm it has such a big role in why people act violently. They don't, you know, there's no other choice. This is where they live. This is their community. It's not necessarily that they can't wait to go out and go to the corner and participate. It's that going to school is a dangerous, threatening, scary thing. You have to walk past these groups. If you're going to need protection, maybe you're going to join one of them. So I think there's a lot of resonance here. And scholars who look at violence are actually starting to do a lot more work comparing the mechanisms, so I can send you emails um, just, you know, with references, yeah. And with the criminal justice system, I mean, yeah, absolutely. I, it's, this isn't necessarily about the criminal justice system, but just in terms of how important having leadership who speak out against violence, against mass incarceration in this country um, is crucial. Uh, my mom and I were watching the Katie Couric interview last night about Charlottesville, and you had religious leaders link arms to fight against that KKK white supremacist rally. That is so important. You know, just having people speak up when our rabbis go to protest or, you know, other religious leaders or when they join together in the civil rights movement, you know, this, we need this. It's, these are moral leaders. They have a role to play because you can't necessarily control what the government is doing. You know, you, I, I used to give this example under Obama and it didn't feel as like prescient and scary. But, um, you know, you have a government leader who is saying, we need to get rid of every X in this country. They're a threat to this country. Um, I'm not going to necessarily hear what the president is saying and say, oh, OK, I'm going to do that. Let me start rounding up all the whatever in my community. Um, what I might do is go to church, go to synagogue. What is my rabbi saying? What is my you know, bishop or my priest saying. I might talk to my friends. I might listen to what my teachers are saying about it. Look at what the police are doing. I live in California. The governor is speaking out over and over again. We're a sanctuary state. Los Angeles is a sanctuary city. We refuse to let ICE round people up. We refuse to discriminate against Muslims. My synagogue is a sanctuary synagogue. That is so important. Um, and so it's, I think it's directly relevant to what's happening today. And, and the point is that I can't control necessarily what the president or the chancellor is saying, but what's going to shape my perception of what I can do to fight back against it is what my local community is doing. So I think that's very important. Thanks. Thank you so much again for traveling yeah. so far. Thank you. Thanks for giving me an opportunity. <laughs>